uh, be focusing on a few different areas. To get started, we'll talk about the critical differences between relational, relational databases um, and the scheme on this world, particularly focusing on distributed document databases. Next, we'll jump into the, the evaluation process uh, for evaluating NoSQL. Uh, and then finally, we'll take a look at use cases and the, the good fits for uh, the NoSQL solutions. Uh, just to give you a, a reminder, this is just a reminder, it's a part of the webinar series. Uh, the first one is for architects. We'll have a, a couple more coming up. But before talking about, before talking about uh, the critical differences between, uh, between relational databases and NoSQL databases, let's talk a little bit about uh, document databases. There's a lot of databases out there in the NoSQL world, and this is a catalog to show you uh, the different kind of stores that are out there. NoSQL databases sort of started off from key value stores. Uh, a key value store is simply a, a database where you have values that might be just uh, pure blobs um, that are accessed using a key. Uh, Memcached, uh, Redis, these are, uh, these are in-memory stores. Uh, and you also have databases which are actually uh, with, uh, with persistence. Membase is the precursor to Couchbase, uh, which, is, which was a key value store. Uh, and uh, it's a distributed key value store with uh, the ability to scale out linearly. Couchbase is a, a document database uh, that's uh, a, a descendant of Membase as well as CouchDB. Uh, MongoDB is the other document database that you hear about. Uh, and then there's other different kind of NoSQL databases. There's uh, column stores like Cassandra, where uh, data is organized by columns vertically. Uh, and there's also graph databases like Neo4j, uh, which are really good for a graph, graphing uh, um, analysis, as well as a friend of a friend kind of queries. And today I'll focus on document databases. So let's, let's see what are the high level characteristics of a document database. Now each database in the, uh, each record in the database itself is self-describing. So here you see a, a, a document with a, a few different attributes, uh, U, UUID, a time, server, and so on. And uh, each document itself has an uh, independent structure. And so uh, when you compare this with a relational database, um, every record in the relational database looks pretty much identical versus a document database where every record or every document can look very, very different. In some cases, you might have a simple document with a few attributes. Uh, in some cases, it might be more complex, uh, like we have here, uh, with uh, actually an object embedded within a document, like the details attribute. Document databases are, um, these documents are accessed using a unique key. Uh, it's uh, similar to a primary key. Uh, and uh, in, in the case of, um, uh, couch space, we actually use JSON as a representation to store these documents. Uh, there's other ways to store it as well, XML or their derivatives. Um, MongoDB uses uh, binary JSON as an example. Uh, and these documents are uh, indexed and queryable. Uh, this is different from a key value store. A key value store, uh, primary, the primary use case is accessing data really fast or writing data really fast using a key or a document ID. But you get a lot more with a document database. You get the ability to index to look inside your record or your document uh, and look for specific attributes. Uh, indexing is implemented in a few different ways, and I'll talk about it uh, slightly later in the presentation. Uh, and then most importantly, uh, distributed document databases offer auto-sharding. Auto-sharding is the ability for, uh, of a database to scale horizontally, uh, and content is then distributed using some techniques in some cases, range partitioning is used. Uh, in the case of Couchbase, we use um, an al algorithm similar to a consistent hashing algorithm that spreads data uniformly across a cluster uh, as more nodes are added. High availability is the other key aspect of document databases. And uh, this gives you the ability to replicate to other nodes within the cluster and the ability to fail over in case of node failures. So with that context, let's, let's dive a little bit more into the differences between NoSQL and relational databases. 
Uh, and, and there's two key aspects that come up. To get to these, let's see what's changed. What, what's changed since uh, the time of the relational databases uh, were, were invented and started off. Uh, and you'll see there's three key areas. There's, there's, there's the user aspect, there's application, and then there's the infrastructure. The number of users that are actually using an application has changed drastically. I mean, we, the, at the end point, we had 2,000 users perhaps uh, in the early days. But today, we probably start off with 2,000 users. We, we prototype with 2,000 users with the hope of having millions of users. Uh, the other difference is that the, the user population itself is extremely dynamic. You don't know when you'll have more users. You don't know what the demand is. Uh, and you just need to be prepared. There's a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty and demand that you have to deal with. From an application perspective, there is a lot more innovation and a, a lot of uh, specialized applications that are uh, that, that customers are building, that users are building. Uh, and the kind of data that needs to be handled is very different as well. Uh, it's not structured records anymore. Uh, it's semi-structured, unstructured information um, uh, in a, at a broad level. And this, this information needs to be represented or modeled uh, differently as well. And then finally, infrastructure. Infrastructure is the, the hardware that you were using or the networking that you were using in the past. And that's obviously significantly changed. Uh, with the key difference being that memory is significantly cheaper uh, and available to end people. And so the kind of consideration that, that you make uh, when designing a database have changed. Uh, they're not disk-based anymore. Uh, they're memory-based. So that takes us to comparing data models. What do the, how do the data models differ for a relational database um, and a NoSQL database? Well, some of you might be familiar with a, a graphic like this. Uh, you probably have a, a relational um, uh, a database uh, somewhere uh, in-house or uh, uh, that, that's serving up a, a web application uh, with a schema that looks like this, several tables, uh, lots, of, lots of foreign key dependencies, and so on. Um, now, while NoSQL might be in the early stages of product maturity and may not be able to completely replace an application that's this complicated, it certainly is very well suited for some kind of application. Uh, and let's, let's first understand the model and the scalability aspect. And towards the end of the presentation, let's, let's take a look at, well, what kind of applications is it a good match for? So most of you are uh, familiar with uh, a table. A table is essentially um, a set of uh, rows and columns. Uh, each record in the, in the table is pretty identical. Uh, it, will, it has the same columns as fields in that record, uh, accessed, uh, accessed as a row. Uh, and this this, each record looks pretty identical in terms of um, what's stored in it, the size of the record in some cases. You, you, you could have variable length records, but it, it gets harder and harder to represent changing content or um, different kind of uh, nested information in relational databases. With a document model, however, uh, it, every document looks very different, as I mentioned. And so um, having, uh, having complex data structures um, is very easy to represent using the, data, uh, the, the document model because you can have different set of attributes. Uh, they don't even need to match. Uh, you could, there are ways to, uh, to link documents, um, and we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but it becomes extremely easy for the application to use the document model because um, you don't need to really change um, the uh, the table schemas as the data changes. And let's take let's take a look at an example and walk through this. And, and of course, this is a very simple example, but I'm I'm trying to uh, explain the concept here. So here you have two tables. One is uh, an error log table, and the other one is a data center table. You have a foreign key, uh, typical foreign key dependency. Uh, you might have uh, information about a specific data center um, in a separate table. And when you, uh, when you want to compute um, a, an, an entire record, you basically look for a, a, do a, perform a join across the two tables. Uh, if the foreign key matches, uh, you're going to generate rows based on uh, uh, some kind of a join operation. Uh, here we have four different records. Uh, for each error that's generated, perhaps you have uh, an additional record that's created. Uh, and um, uh, in the data center table, you have information about 
um, the, the various data centers uh, with some additional information, maybe a phone number, maybe uh, an administrator, and so on. So how would you represent this uh, into as a document? So let's, let's just take a simple use case for the first record. And you could think of a document as, uh, as almost a pre-computed join in, in some ways. And so uh, when, you, when you take the first record, for example, you have a key one. Uh, you have maybe some error that's, uh, that's output with a timestamp. Um, the foreign key dependency is two. Uh, and uh, you see that uh, you have, um, you can perform a join operation, get the, get the, uh, get the record in the data center table, and, and compute that join into a new document. Uh, that, that's represented here below. And, and so you can think of a document as, a, as an object, uh, as an error object that has additional information, and it's almost a pre-computed join. Now, if we have uh, multiple documents for each of these records, you will, you will, that, that becomes your data in your data store. Uh, and let's take a look at how you actually change this information. Do you need to, do you have a schema that you're working with? Um, in some sense, Every document has a schema, but you're at a document level as opposed to a, a table level or a collection level or, or a bucket level. And so if you need to add additional attributes uh, to this error that, that you've been reporting, then you can change the schema on hand, and for the new data that's coming in, you start adding in the additional, uh, the additional attributes. And with this, schema change becomes extremely easy, it's, uh, it's effortless. So uh, the alter table that you would need for a relational database is an extremely expensive operation. In some cases, it could take a few weeks to handle the alter table and the add column uh, for this kind of a schema change. In some cases, it, it could be uh, a month or a couple of months long operation, depending on how large the enterprise is. Uh, and there's a lot of things that need to change along with it. Uh, the other tools that are using the schema need to, need to change along with it. And so with this simplicity of uh, schema change, the application can immediately, pretty immediately, start accessing this information um, on, depending on whether it exists or not. Um, and it's extremely easy to represent all kinds of schema with this, with this document model. So before, um, let me just take a look at uh, if there's any questions that have come up. Um, uh, if there's, there's relevance here, uh, what happens if the phone number changes um, in um, data center two, uh, and is this propagated uh, easily through all the related documents? Now, it's a great question, and, and I'll actually talk about it because uh, essentially you're uh, you're um, denormalizing your data, uh, and you what this causes is duplication. So you have a lot more information, similar information that's stored in multiple documents, and, uh, and in a relational um, schema, if you, if you use a 3NF or the you know, typical normalization scheme, that's what you try to avoid. You try to um, remove duplication, uh, and you try to avoid updating multiple things, uh, multiple objects, multiple records um, if for a single update. And so there's a couple of different ways of modeling documents, and I'll talk about it and hopefully answer this question um, along the way. So what are, the, what are document modeling techniques or um, concepts? Uh, it really depends. It depends on what kind of objects you're representing uh, in, your, in your model layer. Or access together as a single entity, um, or are they uh, accessed at different points at different times? Um, do these objects uh, need to be updated atomically? Um, and are multiple people accessing these objects together? So is there, is there a concurrency requirement here? But in general, um, you need to think of a, you need to think of modeling your data in terms of your uh, an application, and so you need to think of a document as a logical container of your data. Uh, and, and you need to think of how data is grouped for your application. So there's two options. The first one is, uh, we'll have all your document in a, uh, all your data in a single document. Uh, so data is denormalized, as I, I mentioned earlier, it's almost like a pre-computed join. Um, and uh, this really helps with two things. It, uh, it helps with uh, performance, because if you have um, a key value uh, use case, 
you know exactly what document you want to access there using a key. Um, and, and so performance is incredibly fast because you know exactly where this document lives, uh, on which node it lives, and, uh, and, and ask for all the information at one time. Uh, on a scalability perspective as well, it becomes easier to distribute this information across multiple nodes uh, in a, within a cluster uh, because all the information that relates to a certain object uh, is together in one place. Uh, and so uh, the concurrency issues that you would have in a distributed relational database with synchronization um, or log acquisition or a contention or waiting on log um, tends to go away because you're, you're denormalizing or storing this information in one location. Um, you, you do eliminate client-side joins, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about joins in, a, in a, the next bullet there. Um, but the, the application becomes a, a, a extremely straightforward because now you aren't computing, um, uh, you're, you're accessing documents as objects uh, using with keys, um, and the, the applications are, um, can access these documents and look into the values uh, and attributes within a document, um, and the application stays pretty straightforward. Um, however, if you separate out the documents um, into different, uh, for different objects that you're modeling, uh, you, you need to have cross-references. And, and this is almost like a foreign key dependency that we talked about earlier. Um, and what is good for is data replication is reduced, of, of course, because you're, uh, now you're normalizing again. Um, but there's a, lot of, there's a couple of different problems with it. Um, objects may not be co-located. Uh, uh, you might have uh, two documents that, are really, uh, that really belong to the same record or same object. That maybe that might live on two different uh, nodes, um, and most uh, at this point, most people is, is in the early stages of uh, product maturity, and so most of the SQL databases uh, do not support transactions across documents, and so transactional transactionality is supported at at, the, at a document boundary, and so that's something you need to keep in mind when you're designing these uh, documents uh, as a single document or to separate out those documents. Um, most document databases, as I mentioned, don't support joins, and so what this means is your application might get a little more complicated because you need to compute that join on the application side. Uh, and depending on the kind of application you're trying to support, um, if it's a simple Web 2.0 application, um, a, a gaming application, or a session store, um, and that might be sufficient where the application does not need the additional complexity uh, and you can access individual documents. In some cases, for, for maybe slightly more complicated applications, um, maybe uh, building a metadata catalog or um, a, even a, a content store, perhaps, uh, it might get a little more complicated if you have a separate document and objects uh, need to be joined uh, at the application level. So hopefully I've answered this, your, your, your question uh, about um, um, denormalizing and updating um, data uh, if you have everything in a single document, um, in, if you if you separate out the documents, you have a few documents that relate uh, the container information. You can go and update the specific document that has that. Um, we'll walk through a, an example and hopefully it will uh, explain that point a little bit better. Um, the next aspect is uh, a document ID or a, or key selection. Uh, it's very similar to a primary key, and uh, it's uh, it's an important aspect that you need to think about when you're modeling data because there's, uh, there's a, a lot of things, a lot of operations that you could just do with your, uh, your key itself. Um, it's also used for uh, sharding your data. Uh, so your, uh, uh, your data is sharded across several nodes, um, and that's, that's uh, what's used to um, consistently hash or range partition your data across nodes. Um, ID lookup is is extremely fast, and uh, and this is the the, the key value use case where uh, you know you know what information you want, which customer you're asking about, which user you're asking about, or which entity you're asking about, uh, and you use the ID to look up this to look up information about that entity really fast. And so, uh, designing an ID is um, uh, is important. Let's take a look at uh, what, what what considerations um, uh, you you have to think of. Um, you have to obviously uh, have a unique way of representing these uh, objects, and uh, you might want to have um, um, think about uh, how do you uh, doc how do you model these IDs if you have related objects. 
And one way might be to have prefixes, matching prefixes that you can look up faster. Uh, you might obviously want a more human readable um, um, document IDs. In some cases, people use email, uh, or you could just have a uniquely um, generated a, a UUID or a date based ID, and so on. Uh, so before jumping into the uh, example uh, for, uh, for a blog application, let me just take a quick look at a uh, question. Uh, someone asked about um, voice uh, being slightly low. I'll try to talk a little bit louder, but uh, hopefully, hopefully it's a little bit better now. All right. Uh, let's move on to um, entities. Uh, uh, let's move on to the example. So, for a blog application, you typically have uh, three entities. You have a user profile, uh, you have blog posts, and you have comments. And Again, we have two options of representing this information. So you might have um, a, a single blog entry with uh, with a with a title and the and a body that's a part of it, along with all the comments that come in about a specific blog. Uh, the comments could be embedded directly within the document, uh, or you could have um, a multiple documents that are related, um, and the comments are separated out as individual documents because. You might have really long, um, so a few comments that are very, very long. You might have uh, several hundreds of comments for a very popular blog. Uh, and so depending on the, the, the application, you might want to model it differently. Uh, in this case, we have uh, the, uh, the, uh, the comments are modeled as individual documents. Uh, these individual documents have a, a, an ID as well. And then this ID is represented within the main blog document. Um, as, uh, as almost a foreign key that you can look up uh, within your application uh, and, and access the related comments. Uh, the, the comments in, within your main blog document, document uh, it's, a, it's a complex structure, so it could be an array. Uh, you could have, uh, this will grow as you, uh, as a, maybe a, a blog becomes popular. You'll, you'll start having, so start off with one comment or maybe by five or ten, and so you could have different uh, different uh, number of items within the, the array here. Um, and you can almost take this to the next level where you start, uh, you start threading this, uh, this design. Um, initially have a list of uh, comments uh, that point to, and you could have um, an, another set. Uh, you have your first comment that points to another set of comments uh, that might point to uh, reply to specific comments, and you might have more comments as well. So as you document these uh, these uh, these applications, uh, as you design these applications, uh, and you use these different techniques for document modeling, um, you need to uh, and you need to remember that, as I mentioned, joins are not computed at uh, the database level yet. Um, uh, where hopefully the products get more and more mature, and hope to add that functionality in the future. Uh, but currently, you need to have that uh, built on the uh, on the application side. So um, while you're getting a lot of flexibility with modeling your data, different kinds of information, uh, hierarchical information, sparse data, um, as well as the uh, big, big advantage of uh, fast schema changes uh, with, uh, with very li little overhead for those schema changes uh, and rapid application development capabilities, you might have, depending on your application, you might add a little more complexity to that application. Um, there are some uh, some uh, some use cases and applications that are better suited, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the presentation. So the next step, uh, the next big big difference in um, uh, relational databases and NoSQL databases is the scaling model, and that's that's the other big advantages um, in addition to schema flexibility uh, that a lot of our users. Uh, uh, see. So let's take a, a quick look at what this looks like and, uh, and why it's important. So here we have a pretty standard um, setup, standard uh, architecture. You have your application, uh, your end user that's browsing your application, a web app perhaps, and, and you have a load balancer uh, that's sitting in front of a set of stateless web servers, application servers. Now, 
on the application perspective, these servers are pretty stateless, and so if you have more users, your demand increases, you tend to throw more app servers and scale out horizontally um, with, with both uh, fairly linear performance as well as uh, cost, because uh, you might just have commodity servers um, that, that you're throwing at this. However, on the data tier, uh, with relational databases, most relational databases, it's really a scale-up model that's used. Um, you have to, um, you might, uh, you, if, you, if your demand increases, you might have to scale up for, with a more powerful machine. Uh, you might have to add, uh, along with uh, adding more disk and uh, more memory, you probably need more processing power and, and you keep moving up um, to powerful and more powerful uh, machines. However, at some point, uh, you start hitting the performance barrier and, and it's, un it's unable to scale anymore. Uh, and meet your demand, for, particularly in applications that need thousands of operations per second, hundreds of thousands of operations per second, and in some cases, millions of operations per second. And your, uh, your performance starts becoming exponential, uh, along with your cost that starts becoming exponential. And uh, this is exactly what, um, what NoSQL databases help with. So if we switch over to, uh, to the, the, the different model, the NoSQL architecture, um, now, along with scaling out your application server, you start scaling out your, uh, your database tier as well, horizontally, um, and as your demand grows or shrinks, you add and remove, no, remove uh, servers and distribute data uniformly across them. And this is, this is a, one of the, the big advantages of NoSQL, where scalability is linear. You, it is, as you add more servers, you, your throughput increases, um, and in some, and, and in case of Couchbase, uh, again at a pretty stable, low latency as well. And so you have a, a linear performance, along with linear cost, because uh, it's commodity hardware that uh, that most of these applications run on. So before jumping into the next uh, section on evaluating NoSQL and what are the kind of considerations you need to think about when, uh, uh, when looking at uh, an application and prototyping an application using a NoSQL database, uh, take a quick look at uh, questions here. Um, let's see if there's, there's anything um, that's come up. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on to the next section. From a process perspective, uh, there is, isn't much difference in evaluating a relational database um, and a NoSQL database. Now, this is a very, very simplistic uh, one, two, three, four, five approach, but it could, it could be uh, for relational databases, it could be months. A project could be you know, months long or year long in some cases. Um, but the steps that, that you typically follow are very similar. Uh, to what you would follow for a NoSQL database. Um, you analyze your requirements, your application requirements, what are the key things that you're looking for uh, that you don't currently have, um, how do you want to improve the application, uh, maybe the application experience, and, and so on. Um, so that's, that's, that's the first step. Uh, you find solutions and products that match these key requirements, uh, and then step into the prototyping phase with a proof of concept, perhaps, performance evaluation perhaps, depending on the kind of project. Uh, for, uh, for, mis for more mission critical applications, you might spend a, a little more time on, uh, on step one, two, and three, uh, and also, uh, also um, the staging and deployment phase. Um, in case of, uh, you obviously after prototyping, you have a, the development phase where you start uh, uh, application development on a, uh, on a broader scale. And then finally, deploy into staging and then production. Um, and so, uh, it's very, very simplistic representation. Each of these could be split into you know, several steps and so on. Uh, but I'm trying to explain the concept and the kind of considerations or characteristics that you would look for uh, at every step here. And the, what comes out as I was thinking about this, uh, and I, as I put this together, and as I thought about the kind of the customers that I'm talking to on a daily basis and, and, and what they're seeing, uh, with new requirements, there is really a need for a new kind of solution. And matching the technology to your requirements um, is, is obviously going to be based on your requirements. Uh, uh, and, and so the step one itself 
there's a common set of application requirements that I keep hearing about as I as as I talk to customers. Um, let's let's step through this list a little bit and um uh, and explain you know what what changed here. Um, first one is rapid application development, and and this directly ties into the schema flexibility that I talked about earlier, with with the need to iterate faster uh, over applications, with the need for meeting changing market demands faster um, it, it is uh, there's really a very a very big need for schema flexibility uh, the data is changing as well the kind of information that needs to be representing is changing and it and the schema and the structure is changing fast as well and this seems to be the biggest reason why um, why uh, users uh, use NoSQL for for rapid application development it rates faster uh, and the scheme of flexibility in turn. The next as aspect, and I, uh, and I uh, already talked about, is uh, uh, the big difference between relational databases and NoSQL is scalability. Um, the, from, a, from a demand perspective, you really don't know what your user demand is. You don't know what the max number of users are. Um, and you really want to be able to scale out no matter what that is. Uh, you, you might have 35 million users, and we've seen that in some cases. Uh, and you and you want to be able to grow your application without any downtime and just keep adding servers and being able to scale out linearly. And so that's the scalability aspect uh, to to handle unknown user demand, uh, and all, which also means in some cases constantly growing throughput. The next point is consistent performance, and and consistent is important because when we uh, when we uh, uh, have um, users try out our product. And when we uh, when we internally actually do a, um, a performance testing, we look at the 95th percentile or the 99th percentile in some cases because it's the consistent performance that gives you the better user experience. Um, if you're a, a, if, as an end user of a web application or a mobile application, uh, if it if the response times are are very slow um, uh, or the response is very slow and the, and the latency is extremely high, um, people will move on to the next application. Uh, it, 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 you need that stickiness uh, with the low response time. Uh, in addition to this, we need to plan for, for viral growth. Uh, in, uh, it's a good problem to have. Uh, and so you, you will have high throughput. And, and you need to have um, good performance, consistent performance, uh, no matter how high the throughput is. And, and that's the other aspect that um, most, most users are looking for, a consistent performance, both in times of low latencies uh, as well as high throughput. And then finally, reliability. Um, as I think about um, um, databases uh, more and more every day, I come from the relational, uh, uh, relational side. Um, and it's interesting that no, the NoSQL uh, databases have started addressing reliability a lot earlier uh, than the relational databases did. And so reliability in terms of high availability, uh, keeping our application always online um, is, is really a goal that we're trying to address. Um, and this is the fourth and uh, more very important aspect of why people are looking at NoSQL databases. So let's move on to, uh, to the next step. So you might have uh, your, your requirements uh, laid out, and uh, you based on your requirements, you, you try to find good solutions that match. Um, for if you're looking for linear scalability, so ability to add additional servers, additional nodes in your cluster, and, and scale out horizontally, two um, x performance perhaps uh, as um, um, in best case for as you as you scale out uh, with every node when you double your nodes. Uh, schema flexibility if, if that's what you're looking for for rapid application development um, and high performance, which is a mix of latency and throughput. Uh, then NoSQL might be a very good match for your application. Um, this is this might be a web application that uh, um, uh, that has end uh, end customers directly, individual users uh, at, uh, at the end, perhaps uh, not um, uh, not a small number of users. Uh, and and so in this case, NoSQL might be um, a, the right match for for your application. However, if you have complex requirements, if you need multi-document transactions, uh, you need database rollback functionality where you might want to um, go back to a previous state uh, in case of errors, in case of problems. 
uh, you want uh, you have complex security needs. Uh, there's compliance compliance requirements or governance, extreme governance requirements uh, where you need user level um, uh, privileges, role level privileges, document level privileges. Um, or if you have complex joints that need to be computed across objects um, or com extreme compression needs. All these uh, are, are features that hopefully we will add, uh, well, some of them we'll add uh, in, in, as we move along in the product cycle for NoSQL. But currently, relational databases are the best match uh, for these kind of applications or for this kind of uh, specific data, uh, that, that for the data that needs these, these features. Uh, and so you might want to think of sticking with your uh, your relational database, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, you know, MySQL or, or or something else. However, in most cases, uh, there is another approach. Uh, and uh, as uh, users are trying out NoSQL, uh, what we find more and more is that there are certain parts of the application uh, that that need uh, the relational um, the relational guarantees, if you may call it, um, or the relational features. And there's a, a there is a, another side of the application, and quite a bit of the application, where the first three characteristics, linear scalability, schema flexibility, and high performance, um, are driving the, the data and are driving the requirement. And so a hybrid solution for these kind of applications might be the best approach. Uh, you, uh, as an example, if you have um, mo monetary transactions that you're making, uh, that part of the application uh, might obviously would use a relational databases. Um, and then for the other parts of your application, maybe you're storing sessions, maybe you're storing um, user information, gaming information, um, uh, content uh, for uh, specific um, purposes, you might want to use NoSQL as your solution for that piece of data. So, so different ways of thinking about it. Even within an application, you might want to have different uh, objects that need different require that have different requirements, um, and, a, and a mix, a hybrid solution uh, might be the best best way to move forward. Let me just take a quick look at uh, questions here and see if there's let's come up. Okay, so the question uh, I'll I'll address the the sharding question um, uh, in a in a little bit, and is there any backup concept uh, for Couchbase? Yes, there is. Uh, we we have backup. Backups are important. Uh, we we we'll talk about it um, as we move forward. So um, next step is proof of concept or uh, performance evaluation, and there are a few things that you need to think about here. And I've, I've talked about uh, this a little bit, so I won't uh, jump into it too much or go into the details. But the key is the consistent performance. Um, you need to make sure that for your low response times are consistent. Your high throughput can be handled consistently. Again, for better user experience uh, in terms of the low response times. Um, and throughput for viral growth, uh, as well as actually for resource efficiency. Because uh, at some level, uh, if you don't need to pay for those additional servers, then, then you shouldn't. And, and if a single server is uh, capable of taking on a, uh, or producing a higher throughput, then obviously that's, uh, that's better for you. And so. Uh, something to uh, to think about as you're uh, creating those workloads um, for your evaluation. But what kind of workloads are you running? Are you running a read-heavy workload? Are you running a write-heavy workload, a mixed workload, where you have a, maybe a mix of 70-30 or a 50-50? Uh, well, it, it should be consistent across the board. Um, and that's something that uh, we've seen. The different solutions uh, are uh, have different characteristics. Um, and that's as, as, you, as you perform your evaluation, try to build a uh, simulator workload that's closest to your requirements, obviously. Um, it's probably something you do with today with relational databases. Uh, but also look for consistent performance across uh, cluster sizes. So as the cluster grows, does it, does, is it give you a, does it give you a linear throughput uh, uh, that's constantly increasing? Um, is it, uh, does it maintain the low latency uh, no matter what the size of the cluster is. And, and those are some things to look for. Along with this, uh, we, we warn for some things. Uh, contention, heavy locking uh, is bad. Uh, this is something that we've actually, uh, at Couchbase, we've tried to work hard 
to uh, give you very, very low granularity of locking. And so there is no, um, there is no database-wide, node-wide, collection-wide uh, lock. Um, you have individual locks for individual objects. Uh, and so you, this is exactly what gives you the high throughput um, as you scale out, uh, irrespective of um, your right, your right workload or your mixed workload or your workload type. Um, convention is bad. It's um, it's something to watch for. Uh, and then linear scalability is a plus. And if you see that uh, your throughput is growing constantly as you as you move from three to four nodes to five nodes to ten nodes. Um, that, that's great. You have more confidence in your solution. Do you have guidelines for uh, assisting with setting hardware uh, nodes to the various system loads and uh, load profiles? Um, we 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 do. We uh, as we work with the uh, users, um, we provide some guidelines. Our manual and our documentation also have. Uh, some additional information about what are the uh, what do you need to watch out for. Um, in case of Couchbase, uh, the we have a built-in object level cache which, which gives you the the high throughput, uh, the low latency. Um, and what what that does mean is though that you are uh, you can ingest and read information extremely fast. Um, but you at the end of the day, you are uh, uh, disk speeds are, are what you go by for persistence. And so in some cases, depending on your need. Um, you might use uh, SSDs at the back, uh, or even uh, different kind of storage tier at the back. And so, yes, there are um, different guidelines that, that we provide uh, depending on the characteristics of the application. Um, so, uh, feel free to reach out to me after the presentation. I, I can help you a little bit more with that. What are the other considerations? And uh, here I'll talk about a few different aspects. Um, uh, these are things. I think there was a question about um, reliability. Um, and auto sharding, and I'll hopefully get to that as well. Uh, accessing data, uh, there's, it's important to understand how, how to access information. There is no standard yet, so no SQL, uh, SQL uh, is extremely well known. Everyone understands it. Uh, it's standardized across databases. It, it for most part, uh, although different uh, relational databases have their own extensions and have their own uh, different nuances. Um, but there is no standard, and so uh, when you look for solutions, look for um, the, the API, uh, look for SDKs in your choice of programming language. Uh, for Couchbase, we have uh, we have the most popular ones. We have, and these are completely supported. These are commercially supported SDKs. Um, so Java, .NET, uh, Ruby, C, PHP, and Python. Uh, and this is what gets you the access. So this is what. You have a smart client that, that takes care of the sharding um, for you uh, and directly access the information that where, uh, at the node where it lives. Uh, and so the application is completely unaware of any, any topology changes um, or, or the topology of the cluster or where a specific document lives. Um, this, is, uh, this is the way uh, we implement um, uh, auto sharding and your data is distributed across your cluster depending on uh, your key. Uh, the other aspect uh, that we heard about is, um, well, is it compatible with anything else? Um, in our case, we, we, we are completely non D compatible, actually. And so if you have applications that uh, are, uh, are working uh, with Memcached on the front end, then you can very, very seamlessly actually move over those applications um, to Couchbase. Uh, there's a proxy layer uh, uh, that, that we have that, you can, that, that applications will connect to. Uh, to do the auto sharding for you because you still obviously need to do that. Um, it just goes through a proxy layer um, instead of the smart SDK. Consistency. Um, what is the level of consistency that uh, that's supported? Uh, in most cases, it's, it's document level, and so uh, we are basically um, acid uh, at a document level. So if you have a single update to a document, it's uh, it's if you're you know you're sure that it's going to be. Um, uh, it's going to be, uh, it's an atomic operation, it's durable because of replication, and I'll talk about that next. Um, and it's, um, uh, it, it, you, you don't have contention, so the, so the lock is that you, could, you have optimistic locking and pessimistic locking, uh, and so depending on the kind you use, uh, you will not get conflicts. And so if two users are accessing a single document, 
um, you will uh, you you have the ability to check for um, the uh, the ID uh, a, a system ID we call a CAS um, and see if it's different if it if it's changed you know that someone else has updated it and you will not be able to perform the update and so we are consistent at a, a at a document level uh, understand your a application needs because in some cases you might want um, uh, multi-document transactions um, and when I say multi-document transactions I mean that uh, a single update statement um, or a um, uh, an insert statement in, in relational databases can touch multiple documents. Uh, so you say update um, a column uh, equals uh, update this a column uh, or field uh, where uh, this other column equals a specific value that might that might go and update ten records. Uh, and so that is something that most you know, uh, document databases do not support currently. Um, uh, updates are atomic uh, at a document level. Uh, availability. High availability is um, is something that is a is a key aspect of NoSQL in, in general. Uh, different solutions implemented differently. In case of Couchbase, we have um, uh, we we like to keep it simple. Uh, we every node is identical. Every single node looks exactly the same. Uh, it stores active as well as replica data, uh, and so you you don't have the complexity of managing. Um, multiple uh, replica, replica sets and so on, and when you add uh, add um, additional servers, if your demand increases, it's relatively uh, easy. Um, we have a replication that's implemented at a, at a memory layer, and so um, the the replication is it's pretty fast. It's uh, it's even faster than persistence in some cases uh, because it's done at a memory layer, uh, and you can have a, a configured number of replica sets. Um, operations. So we have a um, lot more on the, um, uh, the operational side. We have a monitoring system um, where we have a, a dashboard. We have a REST API that you can hook up with. Uh, backup and restore is important. Uh, we have online backup uh, where you can perform, uh, uh, take a backup of your database uh, and then restore it at some point uh, uh, on another cluster, for example. Uh, and uh, the other other side of operations is being uh, up and running all the time. So your upgrades and your maintenance are all done with your application online. You never ever have to take down your application. And of course, you want you want to have uh, support, uh, commercial support in case of uh, critical systems. Uh, we talked a little bit about ease of scaling. Uh, so you have your client that takes care of the auto sharding for you, uh, and so the application itself is completely um, uh, oblivious of the the complex uh, sharded database sitting at the back. Uh, it's a single node type. Uh, and you can have all the topology changes online. So you can add nodes, remove nodes, all while your, while your application is online. And finally, indexing and querying. Um, we have, uh, with version 2.0, uh, we have secondary indexes, which, are, um, uh, which you can create using map functions. Uh, they also have incremental map reduce for real-time analytics. Um, and uh, in these, uh, the map functions are similar to materialized views. You create materialized views, and then you can um, uh, look for specific information uh, within that, and you can uh, have range queries, um, uh, starts with ends with kind of queries, and so on. Um, aggregates are done using uh, grouping, uh, uh, using reduce functions, uh, and so on. Uh, begin development. We've talked about the design and um, uh, designing of documents, and so that's something you you can think about as you uh, work through your development phase. And then finally, deploying uh, and staging and pr and production, and so. Uh, here is where all the key operational aspects come up. I think someone had a question about backup and restore. Uh, it's, it's a part of uh, deploying and um, being being ready in production. We have a RESTful uh, interface, and so you can hook up uh, the, the staff uh, into any of your any monitoring system that you have, whether it's in-house um, or whether it's Nagios or, or or something else. We actually have a Nagios integration as well. Um, high availability, we have a replication. You can set up a, a configured number of replicas. Um, and uh, you have failover, so manual failover, where your, your, sys, uh, your system administrator knows exactly when a node goes down and, and uh, starts, kicks off a failover. Uh, and auto failover, which is uh, the system automatically detects the node going down um, and fails over to the replica and bumps up the replicas to life.
always online is uh, is something that uh, we um, we always <laughs> we always think about and uh, when we uh, when we design the database and de design the features particularly uh, database upgrades are known to be very very painful um, and what we have uh, we, what we have is the concept of an online upgrade uh, that is the application is online of course you do it when not not when your load is a peak uh, at, at the peak point uh, but you have a, you have a rolling upgrade where you can move out upgrade one node or a few nodes at a time, and you can have a mixed cluster. And uh, this allows you to not only do database upgrades but also software OS patches, uh, upgrades, uh, hardware upgrades, adding more memory, adding more disk. Uh, you can have online backup. Uh, the store is obviously online as well. Um, index building is completely online. Uh, compaction, which is uh, defragmenting, is completely online as well. Um, just a quick look at our uh, UI, actually. Um, you have uh, various things that you can look at from a ops per second perspective, uh, 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 crud perspective, what's changing, and, and so on. So are you being impacted by these? And uh, I'm running a little late. Are we, uh, it's about five minutes to go. Uh, I'll try to wrap up here uh, pretty quickly. Um, and try to answer a couple of questions that have come up. So is NoSQL a good good, uh, good solution for you? Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on the kind of uh, application you're building, but also kind of problems you're seeing. And, and I won't go over each of these questions, but at a high level, uh, you might have, you might already be using your relational database as a NoSQL with maybe sharding, sharded key value store. You're trying to do it yourself. Where you're, you you have might be a, a, a you have a, the application is aware of which which document lies where or which record lies where you might have sparse tables where you know, uh, you know there's very very little information in some of those columns um, uh, and only three or four columns are truly where your in, in, information lies uh, and and a flexible schema a documenting model is the best way to represent this. Um, and uh, if you have frequently changing data needs, um, uh, it, it's another uh, reason for you to look at NoSQL. On a scalability side, you know, are you constantly upgrading? Are you constantly moving from a four core to a six core to an eight core machine uh, just because you have a higher demand and because you need to do more with those servers? Um, you might want to look at a, a linearly scalable horizontal solution. Um, if you're Throughput, particularly your right throughput. The right throughput is where the where we've seen most issues. If you have a very heavy right throughput requirement, you might want to think of um, uh, NoSQL because um, uh, we have uh, you, you scale out. Um, and so, uh, so for right, we we have a very low level of uh, lower granularity loss and there's less contention, uh, and it might be um, what you need. So where is NoSQL a good fit? And, and there are a lot of applications where uh, NoSQL is a good fit. Um, instead of coming up with a list of here are the verticals uh, where it might be a good fit, here are the, uh, uh, the, the 10 applications um, where it might be a good fit, what I did was I thought about it from two different perspectives, from a performance perspective and from a data perspective. And I would say think about these aspects as you are building your um, you're, you're architecting your application. You're thinking about the next application. Uh, do you need low latency, high throughput? Um, do you even know how many users you're going to have? Uh, is it going to be in the millions? Uh, or is your throughput going to be in the hundreds of thousands or millions? Um, unknown demand, uh, or of course, an, a sudden need for sudden growth. You overnight want to add double your server size, and we've seen that with customers that have been that have grown where the app has gone viral, where overnight they've, they've doubled their cluster. Um, uh, do, do, are you predominantly uh, using uh, direct document access, uh, on a key value access, um, and so on. And so think about the performance aspect, and then the data aspect as well. Um, support for unlimited data growth. Um, uh, is your structure um, homogenous or not? Um, do you have third party? This is an interesting one. Do you have third party data that you're storing? or uh, end-user defined structures that you don't have control over and are changing fast and you can't keep up with it. Um, and this, is an, this is this one which recently came up. And then finally, variable length, documents, uh, sparse data, uh, hierarchical data, and, and so on. 
And so these, these requirements uh, drive the use cases, uh, so, and that's what I would encourage you to, to think about. Um, I'm actually going to skip the overview of Couchbase and try to answer uh, some of the, the, the questions that have come up. And um, we have a couple minutes left, so I'll try to get to most of these. Is replication sync or async? Uh, replication is uh, async by default, and so it is. Uh, it happens at a memory layer, uh, at the memory layer. Let me actually bring up a chart here to, to help explain it. Um, it happens uh, at the cluster. Every node has a data manager and a, and a cluster manager. The cluster manager is the one that takes care of the replication to other nodes, uh, and so this happens at uh, at the memory layer itself, where the once, uh, once the information comes in, it starts being sent out uh, to um, to other parts, uh, other nodes in the system. Uh, we do have an option uh, in um, uh, in the next version where you can look for replication. So um, ask the client and, and say, is it replicated yet? Uh, let me know once it's replicated because uh, I want to make sure it's replicated. So you have that option. Um, moving on to the next question. Is the client layer a single point of failure, or can you have uh, redundancy here? Of course, you can have um, multiple, multiple clients. Every application server can have multiple clients running. Uh, we have connection level, uh, connection management, and so that, that takes care of uh, uh, all the connections for you. And uh, you, can have, you, you can have redundancy there. It, uh, it, it is what does the auto sharding. And uh, so once you know what key it is, it hashes it. It knows which server it lives on and directly connects to that server. Is backup atomic as of uh, the start of backup or as of the end of backup? Um, that's the recovery point objective, so the, uh, the RPO question. Um, at the moment, backup in most solutions um, is it's not an atomic operation. I mean, it's, it's consistent to at the document level. But you don't have control over exactly uh, up to what point it is, and it's not uh, in, in most cases it's not incremental. And this is actually an area that we are actively working on. Uh, what we want to improve in the future, um, backup and restore, uh, supporting file system snapshots and, and, and things like that. There is a stigma that frequent updates to single documents are slow in document stores. Have you encountered that uh, mental, uh, mentality, and does it hold uh, for uh, for Couchbase? Um, actually, CouchDB is the question. CouchDB is a separate uh, uh, it's, it's a separate project. It's a, it's a separate product. Um, it's a single server solution. Um, Couchbase, on the other hand, is the, the high performance um, solution with built-in uh, object level caching that uses CouchDB technology as a, as a back end for persistence. Um, we, what we have seen is we are really good at updates. In fact, um, what, when we, because of the asynchronous um, layer where you have a RAM on the top and disk at the bottom, updates are extremely fast. You can have a, a heavy 90% write um, uh, workload, and it will be, uh, you, you will not see issues because there is no contention. Uh, there are some other databases that have a global lock across a a doc an entire node or an entire database. Uh, that's not something that's a problem for us, and uh, that's actually our strength. Um, given that our persistence tier is separated out, we actually dedupe. And so if, an, uh, if a single document is being heavily updated, like in this case perhaps, uh, where you're, you're getting the same uh, document being updated, uh, you will have uh, dedupe when you're persisting, and it will pick up the, the last change that's, uh, that's in memory. And so you, uh, you actually benefit quite a bit uh, from this uh, asynchronous layer, uh, tiered architecture. You mentioned SDKs are available. Uh, is this restful um, if a developer wants to stay in JavaScript? Um, at the moment, uh, all, our, all our SDKs are language-specific, so they are API-based. Uh, in the future, uh, we will we plan to have uh, RESTful APIs for document access. However, um, uh, in version 2.0 for querying, for uh, creating, uh, for management, 
uh, so for management uh, of buckets, creating deleting buckets, management of um, views and indexes, uh, as well as for querying information, that's a completely RESTful in interface. Um, it's obviously, it, it also has APIs in the SDKs, uh, but if, if that's your preference for to keep the application simple, uh, then you could use the RESTful uh, in API. Uh, by client, I mean the layer where the sharding is done, and can this be separate? Yes, this can be. This can be separated out. Uh, this is a separate tier from the application itself, and so it 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 manages. Um, let me actually jump back to one slide and and wrap up there. So the cluster management is done at the using uh, a, a protocol where it, uh, the Couchbase client library has visibility into what those changes are. Uh, and it is, and the application does not is does not need to worry about any of those issues. All right, I think uh, we're uh, up to the uh, little bit over uh, time and uh, about four or five minutes over. Um, final question is: uh, Are there any tools to transform relational databases to NoSQL databases? There might be community uh, solutions out there. However, I think the, the key aspect that I hope you took away from this presentation is the way you think about the application, the, the considerations that you make are different with NoSQL. Uh, and while it might be easy for uh, a tool to complete, uh, you know, move SQL statements to uh, something else, uh, you need to think the way you model your data and you need to think about your application. And so um, uh, that's something that I would encourage you to investigate further. Uh, with that, um, hopefully you've, uh, uh, you've, uh, this has been a helpful presentation. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, I skip, uh, skip over to, uh, to the final slide here. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, and I believe we will be sending out um, uh, the, the slides as well as uh, recording uh, to everyone in a, in a few days. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time.